I think I don't know if I said this already. I think I did, but I think the show was pitched as like the space odd couple or something. The odd couple in space. Welcome to episode 22 of the Audio Book Club podcast. I'm Stephen, your host for this episode, and with me as always are Jonathan, Jason and Michael. Say hello, guys. Hello. What's up? Hello. And in this episode, in this episode we'll be discussing and reviewing Red Dwarf, Infinity Welcomes Careful Drivers. Quick summary first before we get into it. So the book is set about, I think it's about 200 years in the future, and humanity has like colonized the rest of the solar system. Uh, most of Earth's natural resources have been used up and there's like colossal spacecraft going about which mine for you know mine the different plans for different uh, resources and that. Uh, the story follows Dave Lister who's a sort of space bum for lack of a better term. <laughs> uh, space waster. Spacer. Uh, feel free to use that one. And he, he's wound up stranded on one of Saturn's moons after a monumental drinking session and ends up signing up to one of these mining ships in an effort to get back home. He ends up going into stasis, stasis for breaking some rules, uh, which is like suspended animation, so you get put in a room where time can penetrate, so you're essentially frozen in time. And while he's in there, an accident occurs on board the ship and wipes out the rest of the crew, and he gets woken up three million years later, and he's basically on by himself, and... A hologram simulation of his former bunkmate is there, and there's a sort of odd couple relationship thing going on. So that's that's a kind of quick overview. Why did I pick this book? Well, I think, I'm not sure if I talked about it in the last episode, but I'm a massive fan of the show, read the book before and loved it, and just wanted to share it with my friends and get their opinions. I know Michael's read it before, and he loves it. So I was keen to see what the other guys thought of it. Now, in my typical paranoia brain, I'm concerned that the other two aren't going to like it, but sure, let's jump on it and see see what they thought. I'll just jump on there like a quick spoiler-free review from everybody. So, Johnny, do you want to kick us off here? Tell us what you thought. So, I think uh, in the last episode, we might have, I don't know if we discussed on the episode or we discussed it after, but I think we were drawing like comparisons that this might have been a bit like Hitchhikers. Mm-hmm. Which I definitely think it's. I think it's a bit more wacky, like and about uh, definitely a bit more raw. Like I'd say British comedy. It's kind of like I'd say what like the UK office is to the US office in terms of what this is. The Hitchhikers. I did think it sometimes it was a bit over the top. Yeah, but for the most part, and there's some pretty funny parts in this book. And I definitely think I watched the first season and a half of the TV show as well, from which the the. I think the TV show came first in it, so the book was written more or less at the same time, but just after it. I think that's right, yeah. Yeah, it follows, it basically follows the same kind of major plot points, and I think watching the show then, just after having read the book, uh, gave me this extra appreciation for it, and there's some, you know, absolute hilarious moments in it, um, which I like to get on the more. But yeah, overall, I enjoyed the book. Nice one. Wasn't expecting that somehow, but there we go. Uh, Jason, what did, what did you think? Um... Well, me with it. <laughs> uh, it's funny. Like, uh, obviously, I'd I'd left sort of at the tail end of the last podcast after the review, and I think I listened to it back very recently, when it was just published. And I think uh, yourself or Michael or someone just sort of said, "I wonder how Jason's going to get on with it," you know, after yeah. uh, Hitchhiker's Gate and everything. <laughs> I'm coining that phrase. Uh, <laughs> I I mean immediately thought the same thing once I found out what the book was. I thought, oh here we go. Another British dry humour sci fi book. But I definitely enjoyed it more than Hitchhikers. Succeeded where Hitchhikers failed for me. Class. No, I I, I enjoyed myself with this book. You know, I, I I think I might have even been the first to finish it of the four of us. I think you were. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I did absolutely blast through it in like one weekend, but I did have like a big work trip, so 
it helped that I was on a bus for about eight hours one day. <laughs> but no, overall, I, I had a had a good time with this book. I enjoyed it. Um, and I'll give more detail when we talk about it down the line. Nice one. That's interesting. Just just thinking there. So you you read the you listened to the whole thing in one sitting? No, I was. Oh, no. I, I was on a so I was traveling down to Manchester with the football team that I work with. Don't know if I should be naming names on the podcast. Sure, sure, sure. Be remain nameless. Uh, he said traveling down. No, no. Ah, uh, well, from Scotland, yeah. So that was like a four. Well, it ended up being like nearly four and a half hours down and four and a half hours up. And like there was children and stuff on the bus, so like I couldn't listen to it properly the whole way through, and I definitely fell asleep at one stage listening to it on the way back up. <laughs> Not because it was boring work, just because I had worked and been on a bus for most of the day. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah. I, I, that definitely blasted through it quite a bit that one day. I probably good good for probably half of it at least. Fair enough. Yeah, I was just I was, cause, uh, the reason I asked about that. Just uh, I was wondering if it would be like you know how. Because I've never done that. I've never sat and read a like listened to a book from start to finish in one sitting. I don't think. Uh, so I'm just wondering, would I enjoy it more or less? <laughs> you know, if I did that. I don't know. I don't know. Hard to say. It's interesting. Anyway, Michael, what do you think? I know you've read it before. Yeah, I I hated this book. Um, <laughs> no, I'm only joking. Yeah, Stephen, me and you have talked about this this book before. Uh, just to let the listeners know that uh that we have discussed it before uh i think on nights out and stuff i've always uh said i really like this audiobook because i think it's a great performance as well and i would still sta- i would still stand by that as well i think um i've never read the physical book but i would say this probably shines best as an audiobook i don't think that is a too unpopular thing to say judging by the reviews that i've also read I think this book is a lot of fun. It, it obviously will draw the Hitchhiker's comparison. It, it always seems to to do for... It, it does have a lot of parallels, but it's also quite a... It's quite a dark book when you think about like the implications of a lot of what's going on here. Yeah. But that's that's kind of my, my humor and my sensibilities. I find the book absolutely hilarious, especially like the two titular characters... Um, you know, I think Rimmer is such a good character. You know, I think he's so funny. Yeah, I just, I, I really have a lot of fun with this book. I find it say, around the same as Hitchhikers. Just, it's, it's something that really connects with me. Nice one. Just touching on something you said there about it being a bit darker at times. I, I noticed this like a few years ago with the show. I realized there's a lot of like psychological things in it that you don't really notice unless you've, you've kind of when you're a bit older, obviously I watched it when I was a bit younger, so never noticed, but there's a lot of like psychological um, things going on, like obviously in this book, Lester goes a bit insane at one point, and, and you know, has to deal yeah. with that, and there's, there's stuff like that, like dotted in with the humour, which I think, I don't know, just makes it a much yeah. nicer, like much more bulky experience, if that makes sense, like yeah. much more f- rich or full or something, yeah. Like even the even the major plot points, I'm sure we'll get on it. But these these could have easily have been played like as a tragedy, like a lot of stuff that happens in this. Ah. But it's just it's just seen it through a humorous lens. I suppose it's like a, <laughs> yeah. a black comedy, a dark comedy, really. Like isn't it? No. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it's quite like there, like the levels of a black comedy. But yeah, definitely there's there's definitely comparisons there for sure. But yeah. Cool. No, that's I wasn't expecting that. Anyway, that's, that's great. From good, good three reviews. I'm happy now. All right. I, I suppose I'll just jump straight into the full review then. You all know I love the book. I'll talk talk your ears off about like if I if I do a quick review, so it won't be quick. Um, you already have yeah, talked your ears off. Going to the, the full over the years. So. For years, I well not not in a wee while. Like, oh, well. Jeez. I haven't seen you know what. Sorry, I'm trying to try try and share nice things with you. Just and you just never take it. Like, I still geez. remember the time you tried to share a hitchhiker's me. Stephen, I hold it against you. <laughs> well, I fail in a mess. Like you can't. I can't be. There's. You can't be hundred percent. You know, perfect record. Like uh, impossible. Fair. All right. So for for the full review, I've sort of broken the book up into about six or seven bits. And I'm just gonna blast through them. I've cut out some parts that are sort of like you know they happen, but they're not major. Uh, just so we can get through everything. 
Um, but yeah, I'll go. I'll go into the first sort of bit. So, <clears throat> the first kind of section of the book is where Lister's stranded on the planet or the the Mim- the moon Mimas, which is one of Saturn's moons, I think. And he's been there for a couple of years. As I said before, he ends up there after he's a monumental drinking session where he was out for his twenty fifth birthday, and him and his friends like travel around London to do Monopoly pub cl- pub crawl. So they do like a drink at each of the Monopoly locations. At some point, he wanders off and blacks out. And when he wakes up, he's on Mimas with no money, some random woman's passport, and like an odd assortment of clothes. And he can't get back to Earth because he has no. He's not supposed to. It's like illegal for him to be there or something. And he can't get a job because he has no passport. So he sleeps in a luggage locker and he's been stealing these taxis called Hoppers every night to try and pay for a trip home. Problem is that everything on the planet is so expensive that it takes forever and he ends up just spending all his money on drink. And then one of these nights he picks up this man who's like wearing a fake moustache and wants to go to the red light district. Uh, the man claims that he's going to a fancy restaurant but he's actually going to an android brothel. This man's supposedly an officer in the Space Corps and he's like a big deal. You find out later that he's not but I'll, I'll get on to that when we get there. But the, the encounter with this man sort of inspires Lister to sign up with the, the, the Space Corps because he thinks that he can get on a, an Earthbound ship and um, once he gets back to Earth he just goes AWOL and you know he doesn't have to do his job anymore and he's back home. All good. Despite having no qualifications he actually gets posted to a ship called the Red Dwarf. That's one of those mining ships that I was talking about earlier. Uh, he gets he gets posted as a third technician which is the lowest rank on the ship and they basically restock the vending machines and like do general cleaning. At first, he's kind of buzzing that he's going back to Earth, but he he, f- he finds out very quickly that uh, the the trip's actually going to take him four and a half years because they're going the other way <laughs> first to do some mining before they go back to Earth. So he's a bit raging about that. Uh, he meets Holly, the ship's computer, who has like an IQ of six thousand, and he can answer any questions that are asked of him. And then we also find that his his bunkmate is that mustache man from earlier who's called Arnold Rummer and is not actually an officer but a second technician which is just one rank higher so he's he's quite low on the pecking order as well and the the two of them are like polar opposites Lister's a more free spirit and Rummer's like a highly neurotic pretentious person who does everything by the book and then they have that odd couple relationship that I was sort of talking about before but yeah that's that's the sort of first chunk of the book where Lester makes his way onto Red Dwarf and, and all that so what do you think about this part of this, the book Jason go you first yeah uh, as is tradition I <laughs> tended to struggle at the very start of the book actually I, I, I was really struggling to actually just follow what was happening like maybe the first first sort of section up until he sort of got onto the Red Dwarf I was sort of like what is happening in this book uh, I, I was I, I did it does it does jump around a bit at the start, because there's a few things I did mention, like it, it switches POV a few yeah. times. Yeah, I think that always just confuses me in like an audiobook at the start, or just any sort of book, unless it's like blatantly obvious. But because also you're just getting into the characters, getting into the voices, and you're like, it's yeah, I, 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 I was just uh, I didn't really have a clue what was happening in the first twenty odd minutes of this book. But we got there. I had to, I think I'm pretty sure I had to look on the Wikipedia or something just to actually get my head right with the plot, so I could sort of keep up with the rest of it. But once once it was on Fair. sort of Red Dwarf, I was I definitely coped a bit better with it all. I always tend to find as well if I can sort of put a face to a person's name. So like I knew that Lister was like I assumed he was Craig Charge's character, so I was able to sort of yes attribute his that name to Craig Charge's face, which instantly like helped me follow the story a bit better as well. But that's just how my brain works, really. Put a face to the name. No, that makes that. That's fair, yeah. See, I, th- I think do you know? I think because I, I've I've do- I've seen this. I've done this the other way around, where I've watched the show first and then read the yeah. book. I can sort of just natively do that, <laughs> like put the faces in the bo- and Chris Barry plays it so well that I immediately know who's talking. Yeah, about yeah. So yeah, the the Scottish accent sort of threw me a bit at the start. It grew on me, <laughs> but the the Scottish accent definitely at the start. I was like, oh my god, how how am I going to deal with this? But not, not that there's anything wrong with Scouse accent, just the, this particular Scouse accent in the book. I really, it's like, oh my God, this is going to rot through my ears. But we, again, <laughs> uh, uh, I warmed into it, warmed up to it. 
enjoyed the accent. Enjoy, I really enjoyed the voice acting in general. But at the, the start of the book, once they're on the Red Dwarf, I, I, I've, I'd started to get to know the characters a bit better. I started to have a bit of the banter. I was uh, enjoyed, enjoyed the opening section. Good stuff. Uh, Johnny, what did you think of the opening chunk? Uh, yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree exactly with what Jason said. Like, I, I think this is just a symptom of, you know, when you start a new book, for the, you've never heard a story before, or like even like a story within that universe. You can be a bit lost as you're getting used to the characters and stuff. So I thought, I was, thought you know, the same thing. I was like, where, where, where the hell is what's happening here and where are we? And it was obviously jumping a different, a different planet and stuff. And I was like, hold on a minute, well, well, how'd that happen? And, but uh, yeah, I think after like the first few chapters, yeah, you, you get the accents. You're like, you'd be like, right, the Scouse accent is this guy. And then, yeah, I think it's again to you. I had the same issue when I heard that Scouse accent. I was just like, oh, Jesus, is this like a main character? And this is going to be this this accent now for the rest of the thing. But it kind of grew on me then. Like, they actually be listening to it as like the main character. So, yeah, it's more or less echo what Jason said. Yeah, it took a while to warm up to it. But yeah, I think, yeah, after you got through the initial few chapters, yeah, it was, I started to really enjoy it. Uh, there's another thing too, like, about, you know, obviously there's a lot of information being thrown at you here. There's a lot of world building stuff that gets just fired at you. Like, you know, the stuff with hoppers, the, the vehicles that they use and the holograms and all this here. It all it all comes at you quite quite quickly. And stuff like, the you know, the the like drug addicts and stuff where they're on what's the guy on bless where he thinks he's god and stuff and that was quite funny but you know just wee details like that that there's a lot of stuff to wrap your head around i think i the 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 space drugs things really threw me at the start i was like because i remember thinking i was like where where is this going to come in what was the relevance of these drug addicts you know (laughs) yeah right enough yeah yeah yeah, Uh, yeah. it was a bit just like random obviously spoilers but it makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that not to spoil later on, but yeah, it had to come on. It had to be like fed to us before we it happened, sort of thing. Yeah, you know? it's, it's something that's mentioned is like a and it just at the time I just was like, what is the relevance of that? Is it just like a, a gag that there's drug addicts in space? Space drugs. Uh, I think I think the god one was was definitely a gag, but the, yeah, obviously the other one's not. <laughs> you don't want any of this, do we? <laughs> My son, <laughs> stop! I actually, I was on a plane when I <laughs> was listening to that, but I actually did like burst out laughing. But yeah, uh, um, sorry, Michael. Say something there. Yeah, I actually thought it was a strong opening. Um, I kind of, I kind of knew where I was at. This is my, this is my second time listening to this. But even thinking back to my first time listening to it. Um, I, I kind of knew where I was at. There is a lot of uh, switching about of POVs and there's a lot of heavy lifting done in this first part in terms of foreshadowing. And But I think it's done so cleverly and the fact that it is like they feel like throwaway gags but then they come back and pay later. It's kind of like, you know, when, when somebody tells a joke and then it's funny and then and then they tell the joke again and then it's not funny but it, it it's told again and then it comes around to be funny. It feels a bit like that. It feels like this thing that f- I thought was inconsequential, that was just a throwaway little tidbit of this world, ends up being a, a major plot point. So I, I thought th- I thought that was very clever, cleverly done to kind of disguise it in plain sight like that. You know, with the uh, with things like better than life. F- you know that that seemed like a little uh, a little a, a digression at the start of the book, and then it ends up being a major plot point later in the book. Are you guys like familiar with the expression of like Chekhov's gun? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Or sometimes it's described as a knife, but like, yeah, if some if a gun is if it's mentioned in the first act, it has to go off in the third act. Yeah, I think that this sets up a lot of like it hides the Chekhov's gun nearly. It it sort of hides them under the guise of humor, and but then they go off anyway. And for somehow it's more satisfying to me that it does that. I thought it was very clever the way it did that. Right, yeah, it is definitely had, yeah, because the the better than life person doesn't even they're just kind of there. While the the guy that's on bliss is kind of front and center, and he's the gag. Yeah, but it sets up the 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 better than life. Yeah, I did like that. No, as I well. think I think I would agree with you, Michael. But like, I, I'm obviously more not jaded, but like my opinion is corrupted because I've watched the show for years. So. Yeah, sorry, Jason. No, I was just going to say, like, 
just to clarify that I, I did actually really enjoy the sort of the, how they did it. You know, I really, I, I really appreciated it. How this little throwaway gag yeah. became a major plot point as well. Um, but I do remember like, I don't know why it came into my head, but I do remember thinking like, what was the point of that at one point? But I, I, I seen the point, you know, I did enjoy it. It did feel like a good payoff. Okay. So the next little bit is kind of Lister's life in space. Uh, for the next couple of months, so fast forward about five months, and he's kind of sailed into life aboard ship. His routine is pretty monotonous and dull. He spends all his time either working or drinking. I suppose it's not dull when he's drinking all the time, like, but it's pretty sad, I guess. But he, he eventually falls madly in love with Christine Kuchansky, who is a navigation officer on the ship, and they start going with each other. For about five weeks, they're together, and Lester notices that his mood and mannerisms and appearance and everything starts to get better, like almost like he's becoming a better person. And that all changes when she finishes with him and reveals that she was on the rebound the whole time. So then he, he kind of goes into like a depression spiral and messes her and eventually smuggles a cat on board to keep him company. And I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. Uh, but then we also learn a lot about Rimmer in this section. So you learn that he was like, I think he was born on Io and he's got four, three brothers and he's the youngest one and they're all like, they've got really good careers and they're all high ups in the Space Corps and his, his parents have kind of a low opinion of him because of that. So he wants to become an officer and to do that, he, he wants to pass the astronavigation exam, which he's, he's so, so far failed 12 times. And then you, you kind of see a bit more of his like, neuroses through that and uh, you know just the, just the way it goes on so like if he, he fails the exam so many times because <laughs> he spends like months preparing a, a revision timetable that's like all laid up all beautiful and stuff and by the time he's actually done creating it he's only got like a couple of days to revise and he spends that time like making a new timetable which is like much more condensed or freaking out or smoking or like buying Alarm clock so that he doesn't ne- see I've never felt more called out exam. of my school and experience than that, <laughs> <laughs> than that segment. <laughs> I've been there. Is that you, I've Michael? Is that, is that, that, that is, is exactly you, what I did. That is, yes, that is very... I, I did timetables with, like, lofty intentions. Then I remade the condensed <laughs> timetables. I did stuff exactly like that. I remember there was one time when we were in uni, and it was, like, exam time. And you, I was messaging you one night, and you were like revising for an exam. And the next morning, you messaged me, and you were like, "Ah, oh, crap! I've revised for the wrong exam." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that uh, I, I remember that. Yeah, that I, I strongly related to Rummer in that, in that <laughs> moment. So I can see that, all right, yeah. But yeah, so so he kind of he, he's kind of socially inept as well, and tends to like alienate everyone around him. Uh, and he's also got this peculiar habit where he spends some time in a stasis booth, like every couple of days, to like slow his aging, which is kind of ironic when when what's about to happen to him happens. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I'll talk about that again in a minute. Back to Lester. So Lester's been caught smuggling this cat. Because he sent pictures of himself with the cat on board the ship to be developed in the ship's lab. So another crew member arrives to escort him to the captain, but not before asking Rimmer why he's not taking his, his exam. Because there's an exam going on at the moment. Rimmer believes he, his exam's actually in a month's time, but runs back to the sleeping quarters to check and discovers that no, he's included two Septembers on his timetable. So... He panics and realizes that he has to cram a month of revision into zero time. <laughs> so he decides to cheat and copies as much of his textbooks onto his body as possible. Um, Do you ever do that, Michael? That ever happened? No. I did write acronyms on my hands and arms. I, I did didn't go as far as full passages, but. <laughs> so while he's off running to try and get to his exam, Lester's brought before the captain, who demands the cat, uh, so that he can like run tests on it to make sure it's not diseased. Cats or animals or unquarantined animals are obviously super dangerous for a, a long haul spacecraft because it's a closed system. So if a disease gets in, everybody on the ship's probably going to get it. So it's like a serious offense to bring s- such a, an animal aboard. Uh, so Lister won't give, him, give her the cat 
and she decides to put him in stasis and he's going to forfeit the rest of his wages and spend the rest of the trip in suspended animation. It actually turns out that Lister wants to be put in stasis because he's he's got like so much despair over his girlfriend leaving him and he wants to get home and his routine's crap and all this. So he, he, he has this plan to, to get put into stasis so he can just you know wake up and he's back home and it's all good. Uh, so he when he was on planet leave he spent all his money to buy a, a high pedigree cat and got it like all its jabs so that it doesn't actually pose threat to anybody and then he goes into stasis uh, remember fence during his exam and is given sick leave and on on his way back to his bunk he decides to like spend an hour or two in stasis but stops to comb his hair first the ship's reactor explodes <laughs> or reaches critical mass and like unleashes its radiation Killing everybody aboard. The irony being, if Rimmer hadn't stopped to do his hair, he would have been safe. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's that's the sort of second chunk of the book. So I really like this part of the book because it's, it's basically the first episode of the show. And I, and I, and I think it, it's, it's just really well written. And it gives a good insight to like the stuff that happens on board the ship and, and everything. So yeah, I really like it. But... Over to Michael, I guess first time uh, this time. So, what did you think? Yeah, I really, I really enjoyed this part too. This is uh, where we, well, we were introduced to Rimmer in the last part, but this is the part where he's kind of given a name and given a personality. I, I really like like the first scene where he kind of he's intimidating the the room and he picks the the biggest out of the lot. And then, uh, you know, he does the sound effects bonk between between the lines. It was like a, nearly a comic book kind of onomatopoeia thing. But um, uh, the, and we get a lot of like the the dark, the the underlying darkness of this book, like um, the kind of cruel irony of uh, Rummer wanting to preserve time and being so obsessed and staying in this stasis just so he can like. What does it have the body of a thirty-one year old or or a thirty year old when he's thirty-one so, or something, something like, like that? that. He, he mentions about when he's ninety, he'll have the the body of a very spry seventy-year-old or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And he's obviously he's waste, he's he's by doing this, he's also distancing pe- himself from people and like not living life this fullest. So there's there's a bit, a bit of cruel irony in there, and then um. I really enjoy like the 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 scenes we get on the ship, and there's a lot of great turns of phrases and a lot of uh, Lester's inner monologue about love. Uh, I thought thought some of those parts were really, really funny. Some of the ob- observations and the and the dry wit, uh, and and I just yeah, I really enjoyed this part too. And then we get the obviously the catastrophe with the the ship, which is a uh, one of the dark parts again that I was referring to. This could easily be played as this big huge tragedy. And it's funny because I don't, you know, I've never seen the show, so I don't realize that this part was just all a big, kind of massive prologue to to where the show kind of begins, really. Yeah. So the, this this section is basically the first episode. So you start where, you know, he, he's going about this. They're doing their their work aboard the ship. Rummer has an as exam. Uh, you know, Lester gets put in stasis, and then the ship explodes, and he gets woken up. And you know the first episode's called the end, which is I thought was it was quite good, um, but yeah. All right, uh, Johnny. Yeah, I agree with a lot of what Michael said. Um, I thought the the humor really started to definitely pick up to here. Um, this is kind of where the wackiness really kicked off. Um, the stuff of you know yelling around uh, Rimmer and the exam and stuff. There's like I think a funny but in the actual show you get is like when he has all the stuff written down but then it all like fades. It's all like all over his body because <laughs> yeah. because he's sweating and all. Yeah, it's just like so like gacky, but it's it's just hilarious at the same time. Yeah, and you kind of start to get the like the meeting of Rummer and Lister as well. I think that it, the best way to describe them is kind of a bit like do you know the characters from Peep Show? It's kind of like Mark and Jeremy, whatever you call them. Jazz. Jazz, yeah. yeah. Um, Do you know that? Kind of, That's perfect, actually. Yeah, it's like Lister's like Jazz, and Mark is obviously uh, like Rimmer, but really they're just both idiots. 
But it's, I always like the bits, like, for example, I don't, it's probably not come up in this part yet, but it's it's whenever uh, uh, Rimmer's trying to, like, learn, it's the, the language, I can't remember what language is, but... Yeah, Esperanto, so, uh, like, a form of Spanish. And he, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's like, uh, Lister, although he hadn't been the character that you think is more stupid, he knows it really well, and Rimmer just can't seem <laughs> to get it, like, so it's just kind of like these, they're more or less two idiots together but i like the fact that like you know rimmer thinks he's this he, he's got this want to be better but uh, deep down he's just that's not who he is but um yeah i think like michael said you get the 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 kind of like the dark side of this is that like you know he's obviously doing this because his, his how successful his brothers are and and he's probably trying to like please his father and stuff and it's quite sad when you think about that yeah but yeah it's how this this turns that into a comedy as well so it's quite clever nice one anything to add not much more to add. I think uh, uh, how I would describe these characters probably at this stage of the book is that they're just both two assholes, really. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Like, Perfect. I, I, I wouldn't say they're very likable necessarily at this point of the book. Not that I wouldn't say they're unlikable, but I, I do think more negative qualities and good qualities yeah. at, this, at this stage, definitely. I would say... I, I would say Rummer is definitely unlikable, but it's a, a, there is a tragic sort of yeah you know, feeling towards yeah him. He's, he's, he's he is tragic as well. I think that's how you describe Rummer like he is just a tragic man, tragic bachelor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I I think that was that was all I really had to add for the stage. It's just it's good, you know. Bill's the word really introduces to the character, especially Rummer. Gives us a lot more to him, but just between him and Lister, you're just like, yeah, you should both just assholes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they hate each other too. Yeah, of course they would. Which kind of do it. is important for for the next sort of yeah. bit. <laughs> Absolutely, oh, a couple yeah. like yeah, yeah, oh, exactly. Yeah, I think I don't know if I said this already. I think I did, but I think the show was pitched as like the space odd couple or something. The odd couple in space. Or something like that. It definitely is. Right. So then. Um, the next bit, uh, is, so three million years later, Lister comes out of stasis, and Holly, the ship's computer, explains that, explains about the disaster and how he was able to seal off the supply and transport base and pilot the ship out of the solar system to like avoid spreading the radiation to any nearby planets. Uh, but he couldn't release Lister from stasis until the radiation reached a safe background level, which because of the whatever it was that leaked out had such a long half-life that took him three million years but and holly is worried that all this time alone he's gone a bit peculiar <laughs> which uh there's a few funny bits through with that <laughs> so this the, the, the knowledge that he is like you know three million years in the deep space and that he might be the last human alive drives lister insane and he spends the next week sort of drinking really heavily not getting dressed or eating or looking after himself and he eventually collapses. He wakes up in the hospital and finds that Holly has revived Rimmer as a hologram. We learned, I'm not sure if I talked, I don't think I talked about this, but we, we learned in an earlier chapter that Red Dwarf is capable of supporting only one hologram at a time and it's typically used by the deceased crew member with the highest rank. So like, you know, if the captain dies, you bring him back or her back or whatever. But under the circumstances, Holly has deduced that Rimmer is the best person to keep Lester sane, which I think is really funny. <laughs> but it also sort of makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah. Then they plan. They, they make plans to turn the ship around and go back to Earth. Um, because even even if the human race hasn't survived, it's like, what else are they going to do? Just drift through space for the you know the rest of their life. So Holly Holly informs him that he's detected a non-human life form in the now unsealed supply bay and upon inv- investigating they discover like a desolate city um, that has been built in the three million years in the supply area of the ship obviously the ship's massive so it's probably like you know a big mass of town or something and it's got like houses and restaurants and whatever and suddenly Lester gets pinned to the ground by a man in a pink suit who kind of sniffs him a bit before using a portable iron to sort of smooth out a crease in his suit. The man then apologised to Lester for attacking him because he thought he was food. 
And this man is, is known as the Cat. He's the third character of our sort of crew. And he is descended from cats. Whereas mankind was descended from apes. His kind are descended from cats. And it transpires that while Lester was in stasis, his cat, who was heavily pregnant at the time, uh, was safely sealed along with supplies. And her, like, letter eventually evolved into this race of cats that have been living in the supplies of the ship for three million years. Uh, but over the last 2,000 years, they've been fighting a holy war over the name of their saviour, who they think is either called Cloister or Clister. But obviously they're both wrong, which is, I think that's a wee nod to, <laughs> like, religion in the real world. Mm-hmm. Then the the majority of cats have left Red Dwarf to search for this saviour and some commandeered shuttlecraft that they were able to scrounge. And they left the sort of weak and frail behind, including this man. So yeah, that's that's the kind of third section of the book. I think a short, a short enough one. Let's see. What uh, we'll move on to Johnny first this time. What what did you think about this? But we're meeting the cat and you know uh, bringing back Rummer and everything. The first point on the talk is so uh, yeah, like the Holly deciding that Rummer was the best person to bring back. I think there's a good like line um, later on that uh, I think it's when you, they you know they make contact with the Archbishop and then there's like the android. What, you, what was his name again? Uh, Crichton. Crichton, yeah. Like he comes on and like cleans up the room because Rimmer wants a clean. And then uh, Lester's like like telling him that he basically like the boy's like, why do you want why do you want this like mold in the cup? And he's like, because it drives Rimmer insane, and that's the only thing that keeps me going. So it's kind of like <laughs> like that's yeah exactly yeah. why he was the best person. Yeah. yeah, so uh, it's an interesting choice. I think just they talk about the Hall of the Computer is just brilliant, especially in the TV show. Like it's it's this pure like dry, like sarcastic kind of humor. Aha. Everything he says is pure dry. Yeah, yeah. He's, yeah, he's just he's hilarious. And yeah, the like the whole cat thing is just although I find the cat himself quite annoying. Uh, like the whole it's more more the voice than anything. Like this, like a, I don't Aye. know, like soul kind of character. Um, like fucking basically like James Brown kind of character, <laughs> like that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but I think the concept of how the cats evolved and the humans were three million years is just hilarious. I don't understand. Like, oh, I, there's like he still got a lot of these like cat tropes and stuff where he like licks himself, where he like he's always like hunting fish, like he's always trying to get fish smell, and stuff. They they have those smell books. That yeah, use. <laughs> but. I don't understand the whole thing with the the, the suits. Is it? I guess it's because cats go on like they're so majestic or something, and they just look like I it's like so, they love yeah. themselves. But yeah, I think I think it's because you, of how egotistical cats are, yeah. and they're just leaning into that a lot. Yeah, like. I think the, the the I think whenever they first meet, they, they say that the cats they have to go back into like stasis or whatever. But when they're travel, going to head back to Earth, and the, he's like, you can only bring two suits, and he's like, can I cut off an arm and like bring another <laughs> shit to it's just like in fact she was hits but yeah I think the cat the cat character is hilarious I just two suits is dead <laughs> it's like how many you say again ten yeah <laughs> yeah I was <laughs> yeah I just I thought this this section again just like picks up more than the previous so yeah I think the, the book's just like constantly get, gets better for me nice one Jason um, any, any thoughts yeah I, I like this section I like the, the sort of build up to like the colony of cats and you would like the cats yeah, i like the build up to the colony of cats the actual character of the cats yeah i agree probably the weakest character for me yeah. and uh, i just really don't like the voice at all it feels almost like a caricature of anything yeah so, uh, funny though the character himself can be funny at times but yeah annoying but i think that's just cats are annoying <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. As well, like absolutely. I, I could, I, I fully believe that this is a cat man. You know, I think they've absolutely nailed the <laughs> the actual characteristics of what the this. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't mean I should like them. <laughs> it's funny though, because I, I think in the show, this is kind of going off topic, but in the show, the cat sort of he's he's basically the same as in the book, but as the show goes on, he sort of transforms and they like not as much of a cat. Do you know, he still he still has the suits and all, but he, he's more like a a proper member of the crew <laughs> rather than just you know leave me alone. I'm just doing uh, just like napping all the time, and uh, actually the character himself like grows as the show goes on. But it's good. Uh, but no, I think I think the character is actually well written for what they are. I think you know if there was like a 
evolved cat species, like that would be how they would behave. <laughs> no, I really like this part too. Uh, I can't, I can't blame anybody who says that the cat is, as Jason said, a character or one note or annoying. Uh, I can't blame anybody for that opinion, and I don't know why. Because I, I feel like I should feel that way too, but I just find him completely hilarious. <laughs> and um, I looked at pict- pictures of like the cast from the show, and the cat was not what I was expecting at all. I was expecting this horrifying being. Of, like, it's just a guy. This, like, yeah, I know. I was ex- I was expecting something completely horrifying with like this three million years of inbred cats. Like, <laughs> I thought this was gonna be. And and I what I was picturing in my head was completely different, but um, yeah, I, f- I just find him really really funny. He was one note, he was a character, but for some reason that just worked for me. I thought it just fit right into this dynamic. It was like a cheap cheap joke every time, but I still I still liked it. I wonder I wonder if it's because he's not. I mean, he is, but he's not really. There's two there's two main characters, right? It's Lester and Rimmer are the main characters, and he's kind of just there. To, yeah. to fire off the zingers every so often, you know. Yeah. Wonders that way. Yeah, I think if yeah, I think if he was a main character and got as much quote unquote screen time as as Rummer and Lister, he would have been insufferable and annoying to me. But the fact that he is just a punchline, he's just a gag. It kind of just works for me. Yeah. And what what did you think about Rummer being brought back? Any other points to add to that? Yeah, I thought that was like you said, Stephen. It makes a lot of sense. Um, it probably the, it makes a good reason for why several of Lester's friends would actually drive him crazy in the long run, and they just enable Lester and kind of indulge his worst behaviors. Whereas Rummer, he's so antagonistic towards Rummer, it kind of does keep him going. Like that moment that Jonathan referred to later. Where he he just keeps you know the mold in the cup. Uh, I'm sure Jonathan can relate to that because it's the kind of passive aggressive stuff we would have done as brothers growing up, like you know <laughs> just doing really small petty things just to annoy the other person. It was a saint to the end with. <laughs> <laughs> but Michael wasn't though, right? <laughs> Sometimes. All right, cool. Okay, I'm mo- moving on then. So there's like maybe three more sections left of the the plot. So the next sort of chunk. They, they sort of continue the plan to go back to Earth, but the cat is now involved, so he's going back as well. Ham and Lester are going to enter stasis and hopefully just wake up in, you know, three million years again when they get back. Uh, Rimmer's a bit annoyed because he'll just have to either have to sit by himself <laughs> for three million, or I suppose sit with Holly for three million years or just get turned off. And he, he thinks they won't turn him back on. And I don't think they would, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, anyway, Holly reveals that because they've been traveling, uh, constantly traveling, ac- accelerating for three million years, that they're about to reach the speed of light. And when Lester tries to tell Rimmer about this, Rimmer's kind of there as if he's speaking to somebody else who Lester can't see and completely ignores what Lester says. Then he leaves the room, and as soon as he leaves the room, another Rimmer enters from the opposite side, and his sort of reactions to Lester's questions match what the first Rimmer had said. So it's it's almost like, you know, Lester saw the future sort of thing. Then they pass the cat, who's apparently lost a tooth. And once they get back to the sleeping quarters, the cat's in there, trying to eat uh, Lester's robot goldfish. So again, it's like so there's something weird going on. And Holly explains that they're experiencing future echoes, which is a side effect of light speed travel. So you sort of see bits of the future before they happen. Around this time as well, a Polaroid appears, showing Lester holding two babies. And the crew sort of ponder how they're going to get two baby two babies aboard without a woman, which is a fair question. Later on, an explosion rocks the ship and Rimmer reveals that he just saw Lester die. And Lester reckons that if he can stop the cat from breaking his tooth, that he might not have to die. He, he, f- he thinks that the cat's going to break his tooth trying to eat those robot goldfish from before. And when he tries to stop him, he ends up breaking one of his teeth. So it's that sort of like um, self-fulfilling prophecy type thing, right? Later on, Holly informs him that the the Navi compu- Navicomp computer is malfunctioning, and someone needs to like fix it, or the ship's going to explode. So Lister realizes that he has to do it, and he puts on the clothes that Rimmer said he was wearing, goes to fix it with Holly's instructions, and it doesn't explode. And obviously, he's buzzing about this. 
And on the way back to the sleeping quarters, him and Rimmer sort of argue about it. And they discover a very old lister on one of the bunks who tells them that he can't see he can't see them, but he knows that they can see him and explains that it was Lister's grandson that Rimmer saw die. And also tells him to grab his camera and run off to the medical unit where the babies are about to be born. And as he arrives, another Lister appears holding the twin babies and sort of smiles for the camera. And this is the, the, that, that's kind of a, the, the next chunk. So the future echoes. But Jason, what did you think about future echoes? Uh, future echoes melted my head a wee bit. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll not lie. I'm pretty <laughs> sure this is the sort of part of the book where I also fell asleep on the bus. So... <laughs> Right, just yeah. to doubly make things confusing. I feel like I listened to some of this in a vague sort of drowsiness, you know. So not only was my head... It's like an echo itself. Yeah. So <laughs> I had to sort of, again, skim through it a wee bit just to sort of keep myself updated for where I was at. I, I was a bit mad. Definitely the more yeah. outlandish sort of plot point of the book. And it does feel almost like a sort of self-contained episode in a way, you know it. Yes, it does. It's not. It just sort of comes out of nowhere, and it's resolved almost out of nowhere. You know, it just sort of say like one sort of part of the book where this happens, and then it's it's done. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. This, I think this is a good example of how the, all the plot points are lifted from the the TV show, where they're all kind of. They're sort of an overarching story, but they are more self-contained, yeah. Yeah, which probably lends itself better to a TV show in that regard. Yes. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it was just, it was absolutely mad whack, this, this section of the book. I was like, the time travel, essentially, uh, which, fair enough, we're, we're, we're in a sci-fi book with dead people being reincarnated, you know, why can't there be time travel, but... Still just fried my head a bit about everything that was going on in this section. Fair. That's fair. Um, yeah, Johnny, any, anything to add? Um, no, I really, really enjoyed the time travel stuff. I actually surprisingly followed along quite well, though I would be under that kind of mad shit, like, so. <laughs> yeah, like, the the whole, like, different scenes that were going on, like, where, you know, when people were seeing, like, the, the future, and it was, like, kind of a good reveal of it too because you know whenever you the first i think the very first thing you see is that conversation between lister and uh what do you call him rimmer and it's basically him coming out of the room and go, like going out of the room and then another one just comes straight on that's it's that stage and you're like right yeah so there's obviously something weird going on here and, and there was also a lot of talk about the like having the speed of light and they're all like you know this is something that was thought to be impossible so we don't really know what's going to happen when we do hit it so i know yeah something something mad was going to happen uh, but no, I, I really enjoyed the not not only the wackiness, but also like the high interest in this this whole scenario was like obviously we from a physics perspective we still don't really know what would happen because obviously that is currently the law of the universe is that you couldn't hit that speed, but I'm sure some mad stuff would happen if we, if you ever did. So yeah, yeah it's, I just thought it was quite interesting this this take on it. Yeah, I think this section sort of it 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 sort of picks up the speed pun intended. Of the like uh, sci-fi nature, you know, it's got a proper sci-fi um, yeah. plot point. But then it also the comedy still there. Do you know where? Yeah, <laughs> Lester's talking to Rimmer and he's just saying random words. He's like, like what things? And he's you know, that's the deja vu. The deja vu comment. I'm pretty sure because like Lester only says deja vu because. Rummer said it to him before and he's like yeah you said that before he's like well it really does sound like deja vu it's like he only says it because <laughs> he said it before do you know what i mean it's like these kind of like infinite loops of time is just that it's madness yeah i, th- I think it, I, it, the concept works really well with the comedy like um, yeah i think uh okay michael anything to add yeah i i really enjoyed this um this part of the book as well it was very trippy it was very bananas which is right up my my street kind of stuff that i love um, we have like not only the the speed of light laws of physics being broken here, but there's a lot of consequence preceding the effects happening here, which is obviously a paradoxical thing that happens when time travel is introduced in, in stories. But here it kind of works because the laws of physics are being broken so much, you can kind of explain it away by that and say, well, 
none of the laws of physics will apply anymore in this kind of uh, scenario. So, yeah, it, it makes sense in a sort of demented, completely crazy way if you just <laughs> buy into it. I thought like it was a great, it was a great scene for setting up mysteries and setting up these things that would uh, be satisfied later down the road. Uh, setting up t- ticking clocks, adding a bit of suspense to the story, and I think it even added a bit of an emotional undercurrent to the story here because with uh, Luster's future selves, the older self, and then the um, the the more middle aged sort of or whatever whatever age it would have been, I think with thirties or whatever when he had the two uh, children. Cool. Yeah. All right. Swiftly moving on then to the Nova Five. Uh so. At this point in the story, we, we sort of briefly jump to another crew on board another ship called the Nova 5. And the Nova 5 is on an elaborate mission to create, like, exploding stars that will, <laughs> when when viewed from Earth, will look like, spell out a message, for, like, for advertising coke. So this, this crew has is, is, uh, completed their mission and they're preparing to travel back to Earth. But the ship crashes and kills all but three crew members. It's then revealed that Crichton, who is the ship's mechanoid, which is basically like a robot servant, he, he has washed the ship's computer with soapy water, and it's caused them to like malfunction completely and crash. And then we sort of jump back again to Red Dwarf, where Holly informs the crew that they've received a distress call from Crichton on the Nova 5, saying that the three female crew members are injured and they need rescue. So the lads from the Dwarf get all dolled up, and they, they, on, on route to the <laughs> ship, hoping to like, you know, have some fun time with the, the, the three female crew members. But it turns out that when they get there, that the, the three women have been dead for millions of years. And Crichton, Crichton has sort of gone a bit mad and has been looking after their skeletons. But when, and when he's shown the truth, he sort of has an emotional breakdown and shuts himself off. The, 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 the Red Dwarf crew realize that the Nova 5's engines are far better than theirs. And they attempt to salvage the ship, the two halves of the Nova 5. Um, so they, they sort of spend a bit of time bringing that back to Red Dwarf using the sort of mining equipment that's on the ship. And meanwhile, Lister tries to repair Crichton, who, once, he, once he's back online, informs him that the Nova 5's engines will be able to get them back to Earth in like six months or something. But the fuel decayed many centuries ago. Meanwhile, Rummer is exploring the Nova 5 and he discovers that it has a functioning hologram suite, but that all the crew's discs are corrupted. So he decides to make a duplicate disc of himself and, and, and simulate a second Rummer. So now we have two Rummers, which is just amazing. So with the two Rummers, the crew now decides to repair the, the Nova 5. Uh, so the, the two Rummers are tasked with doing that along with some robots, some scudders that uh, kind of potter about Red Dwarf. Uh, and the rest of the crew attempt to mine for and refine the fuel that they need to make the trip. They spend a, a bunch of months and then the ship is eventually repaired and they have enough fuel. But the two Rimmers are fighting with each other because like, it seems that Rimmer can't even get along with himself. So Lister points out that only one of them can go back to Earth because the Nova 5 will only support one of them. And he flips a coin, and the original Rimmer loses, and is supposed to be erased. the The original Rimmer is is obviously raging about this, so but and he's kind of like, just turn me off now. But before he does so, he tells Lister this embarrassing story about something that happened to him, uh, and afterwards Lister reveals that he's already wiped the other Rimmer, which is quite funny. So yeah, that that's kind of the next, the second last section of the book. Uh, I'll go to you first again, Jason. Uh, yeah, this is a strong point of the book for me. Uh, I really like the the tale of two rumors. Yeah, I I thought like the sort of section where you know after a few months and they were arguing with each other and only one of them could live. I think this was probably like one of the stronger like, story notes in that like that sort of dread, that sort of fear. You know, I think. As as yourself and Michael sort of said, like they could really have just done this as like a straight horror, maybe <laughs> or like you know a, a more <laughs> more dramatic. Definitely, I think this was probably like the biggest bit for me. I mean, there was also this sort of the, the voice in my head saying, "Well, of course, the original Rimmer is going to survive." But you know, I was 
pushed that to one side and just suspended my belief and just let myself go for the ride and the 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 fear that even though I, I I've grown to remember probably by this stage of the book, I still think he's an asshole, but he's definitely a lovable asshole <laughs> at this stage. But yeah, it was it was quite nervy at times. It's weird that that like there's there, there, they should be identical, but you do root for one of them. So yeah, it's like a, it's still like an evil twin almost. You know, it's like the the Bart that they've locked yeah. up in the attic. <laughs> um, That's exactly yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, I can't remember what the story was now. The embarrassing story. Gazpacho soup. The, the gazpacho. gazpacho soup. Yeah. It's, so, it's, oh yes, that's uh, right. The gazpacho I'll, soup. I'll, I'll touch on that. Yeah. yeah. I enjoyed that story actually. I enjoyed. And again, I enjoyed in the sort of following chapter what that led into. One thing that oh, I yeah. do <laughs> want to mention, and I, I can't remember what when exactly it's happened, but it's definitely happened at least once or twice by this stage of the book, is the bloody theme music that plays. Yeah, I was going to mention that. I'd, yeah. Not a fan. <laughs> no, I, I don't know why they did that at the start of each sort of but <laughs> like, well, it's, it seemed the first time was okay but then it got annoying yeah yeah my loud and it was well loud yeah. very drony as well no, i wasn't a fan of that but i enjoyed the the actual story the plot line of this and i like i, I like Crichton. this is a sort of first met Crichton, wasn't it aboard the north yep. nova five and so again it, just from knowing like what the cast sort of looks like Crichton's like the guy like a big Androidy, metal heady sort of guy. He's got like a weird head. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, like so I could picture him and I was wondering when he was going to rock up purely just so I could again put a face to the name. But yeah, no, he's he's a good character. I liked him and I liked the sort of plot line of him being like quite insane after spending all this time on his own as well. Yeah. And he doesn't want to like, he just wants to clean stuff. He doesn't want to do any of the mining. No, he just wants to clean. Because he has a cleaning robot. He just wants. <laughs> he wants to serve. Good man. It's very funny. Do you know what? Going back to Rimmer though, I I do think it's it's quite an interesting question. Like if if you had a copy of yourself, would you get on with the you know the copy? No. So no, I don't think so either. I don't think I would like. I don't think I would like that guy. Me and Copy Michael would make so many podcasts together. <laughs> <laughs> You'd make the Michael podcast. That's weird. Uh, all right, cool, Michael. The original Michael, what did you think? <laughs> I really enjoyed this part. Um, just for the listeners who, any listeners out there who do not listen to the book before they listen to the episode, the gazpacho soup story is just basically uh, Rimmer did not know that gazpacho soup was served cold. And this was a great embarrassment to him at the captain's table. And he suspects this is why he was never invited back to the captain's <laughs> table and why he never progressed his career. So he sees this as like his ultimate failure. And it also like harkens back to his uh, original self, his final thought, I believe, before the ship blew up was gazpacho soup. I think so. <laughs> so <laughs> again, this is this is another example of how dark this book is. Not even, you can't even say underneath the surface because it's right there. I thought it was hilarious. Them all getting spiced up before they, there was Lester putting on the shirt with like, it's it was his good shirt because it only had like one curry stain or something like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> And, uh, that's, and that's that scene in the it. show is so funny when he's getting he's getting dolled up because <laughs> like all his oh, clothes really? are just there's holes and all in them and stuff and like uh, I would like to see that in the sh- he like puts on a pair of jeans and like there's a full hole in one of the arse cheeks so he just like gets a can of spray spray kit <laughs> sprays over it <laughs> I thought I thought that I thought it was very funny in the book, so I imagine it would yeah it would be very funny in the show. The the part then with the uh, you know they they come across the, the the bodies again. It's just Lister is such a lonely man because his only allies is like a cat man, the, a hologram, AI things, and then he he finally could potentially find some companions in this lonely abyss, and then it's these dead women. So it's. When when you like scratch beneath it, you know he's he's incredibly lonely. But I'm sure he doesn't see it that way because uh, he he comes to really like the hologram rumor as we learn in this part because he yeah. preserves one. And I think that's a that's an excellent way to exhibit like character growth too. That the two rumors it's it's not only the two rumors hating each other because that's just what rumors do. It's also the fact that 
the older Rummer, the one that we know more, kind of hates what he was as well. And he kind of finds all his old traits insufferable. Yeah, it's almost like he's changed. Both living with Lester for the last couple of months, he's, he's sort of changed. Yeah. Yeah. I think that the new Rummer sort of points that out as well. Yeah, and I think that's... Yeah, he does, uh, exactly. And I think you guys even kind of uh, hinted at that with your own opinions of uh, Rummer, the fact that you said you're rooting for the older one. I think that kind of shows that we feel his growth and we have become more attached to him because of that. He's still very much in the asshole range, but he's like 2% less asshole, so it's it's kind of an arc. Yeah. Do you have any, any thoughts about Crichton? Crichton, yeah, I thought I thought I was fi- fine. You know, uh, it wasn't... Uh, it's not like a standout character for me or anything. Yeah, I, I like I like all the characters in this in this book, honestly. But it wasn't uh wasn't anything special for me or anything. Yeah, I think for Crichton, it's it's sort of a thing with a cat again. He sort of starts out one dimensional, and then he evolves as the show goes on. And then I would even say in the later seasons, he's my favorite character. But yeah. Oh really? Yeah, yeah. I think it's really funny. Yeah. All right, Johnny. Anything to add? It picked up again in this, this chapter or these few chapters. Yeah, the whole Crichton thing with the woman, um, which I thought was hilarious, like the the getting ready, getting dolled up. I thought the even like Holly, I'm pretty sure, like puts on like a toupee, or is that might only be in the yeah, show? Yeah. But, but yeah, he like does, yeah. he's supposed to be this, you know, advanced AI with six thousand AQ, AQ, not supposed to care about women or whatever, and <laughs> if it's on like he's dolling up as well. Um, which I, I think he even funny. says that too. He's like, "What am I doing?" Yeah, <laughs> <So it's> like, <laughs> this is quite funny. Yeah, that that whole scene was quite funny. And then I think that uh, like before they go on, like they they obviously again you have this rela- this kind of relationship between uh, Rimmer and Lister, where obviously they're going to be potentially flirting with girls here, so they're they're each other's competition, but they're also like supposed to be wingmen and stick together. So I think they have a a thing where. <laughs> Rummer wants Luster to, you know, big him up and basically call him Ace, <laughs> which he says is his, his like nickname. And I think he's like whenever he gets, he's like, uh, I want you to call me by my nickname. And he's like, what bonehead? And he's like, how do you know that was my nickname? <laughs> he's like, I just have a guess or whatever. <laughs> but he's like, no, my other my other nickname, basically that no one else called him. And he was like, it's Ace. And then I also wanted to say, tell him that I was like incredibly brave. And then whenever they see that it's like free dead woman, then Luster starts, you know, joking about me like. And did you know that uh, Ace here is extremely brave and all? <laughs> if you're like taking <laughs> like, a hand at him. Have sex with lots of women and everything. Yeah, yeah, wasn't yeah. It? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just a uh, yeah, hilarious, hilarious scene. Yeah, the whole thing with Alicia I thought was quite, again, funny, but also, yeah, quite a humane, nice moment. Yeah, but that's, you know, Lister obviously has the choice and really, you think, high level. It doesn't really matter which one he deletes because they're both the same. But yeah, there's the one that has been with him this whole time and has been, you know, maybe improving. And there's like, if he del- obviously deleted that one, he would have to go back to square one with the last because I'm pretty sure like the hologram is obviously taken from a point in time, you know, whenever before he- this all happened. Yeah. So yeah, I think that that's mad that like they've kind of like even though it is like an identical hologram, it's like there is a difference. And yeah, it's it's I think you said Stephen, it's mad you're like rooting for one, <laughs> even though they're both dickheads. Um, it's funny like. Yeah. But now yeah, I thought this this whole this whole section was uh, brilliant again, just a, another step up again and added to the story and yeah, really developed uh, the characters' relationships. Yeah, just to t- touch on one thing you said there, you were talking about uh, Rimmer's nickname of Ace. Yeah. So th- there's a lot of like tie-ins like this in the book and the sh- and the TV show where so he wants him to call him Ace, but in in later seasons there's another a car- another Rimmer gets introduced for an episode or two, and he's called Ace Rimmer, and he's from a parallel dimension, <laughs> who is really cool, and everybody thinks is like you know hot and cool and all, and it, <laughs> it's just a nice wee nod to that. I think it's quite funny. So rather yeah. than a par- from a parallel dimension, he's from a perpendicular one because he's like. Oh, well, yeah. Completely, completely different. It's quite funny, yeah. Cool. Uh, so I'll move on to the last sort of section here, and this is where it goes a bit mad again here, but... Uh, yeah, so this, this is the returning home, inverted commas, section. So <laughs> they've repaired the Nova 5, and they, they, they uh, make the trip back to Earth, which takes them six months, and it was a success. When they get back to Earth, humanity is basically the exact same, and the crew have now become space heroes. 
Lister doesn't really like the, the, the fame and notoriety and everything, so he kind of moves off to a small town to live in, in peace, essentially. And he ends up marrying Christine Kachansky, who is, was his girlfriend on Red Dwarf. But it's actually like a, her direct descendant and also is completely identical. Red flag there. Uh, they, they have twin sons and Lister's never been happier. But his arms start hurting and he gets this ointment for it. And when he rubs the ointment on it, it, it spells out a message. It spells out messages like dying and U equals BTL. And he sort of tries to figure out what that means. Rimmer, meanwhile, has become the world's third richest man. And he's spent all his money develop, like investing in a company that's developed the solid gram. Which is basically a hologram with a solid body and he can like interact with stuff. So he's, he's made a fortune out of that. Uh, he's got various properties and he's a beautiful Brazilian wife and, you know, he's all happy. But Lister starts to realise that his life is sort of impossibly perfect. You know, he's married to a woman that should be dead. Or, or like somebody who's the exact same as her. He's got two babies that can change each other's nappies and they can even drive a car and stuff. <laughs> and it's Christmas Eve every night. So he's, he's starting And he to, loves in Bedford Falls. And he loves in Bedford Falls, which is the... From It's a Wonderful Life, which it happens to be his favourite movie. So he sort of realises that w- what has happened to them. Uh, and he flies to Paris to, to meet Rimmer, who's having this huge party with like loads of people. And he informs Rimmer that they're playing better than life. A callback to the first section where we talked about that uh, VR game. It's a game where all your fantasies come true. And it kind of it kind of sucks you in and you don't want to stop playing it. So you get stuck, essentially. And they're still on Red Dwarf, so they never left in the Nova 5. Rimmer's a bit dubious because, you know, you know it seems real. But then he sort of gives in when he realises that he's, his house guests include God, Archimedes and Lenin. They're all playing cards <laughs> and getting blocked. It's, it's, now that Lester mentions it, it's a bit strange. Uh, so they, they sort of fly off to Denmark where the cat lives. And any doubts that they had that it's not a simulation are kind of dispelled when they meet the cat because he has been living in a castle surrounded by a milk moat and he's got like a staff of uh, an army of uh, Valkyrie warrior women, uh, <laughs> which is completely unbelievable. And at this point, Crichton appears and explains what had happened. So it turns out that while they were celebrating, uh, you know, fixing the Nova 5 and everything, the cat finds this cache of headbands for better than life. And they, he puts one on. Then Lister and Rimmer went on to save him. Uh, and they also got stuck. And Crichton spent the last two years looking after them. You know, feeding them and cleaning them. And making sure they didn't hurt themselves. While aimlessly wandering around the ship. Before Holly convinces him to laser warnings into Lister's arms. And then Crichton obviously enters himself. But he's sort of unaffected because he has no desires. Other than a new squeezy mop. Which he gets. Which is nice for him. <laughs> they decide to leave the game. But Lister says he wants one more night with his family because he can't bring himself to leave them on Christmas Eve. However, <laughs> in Bedford Falls, it's always Christmas Eve, so he kind of just becomes trapped again and they never get out. And that's how the book ends. So, Michael, what did you think of this last section, the better than life section of the book? Yeah, I thought this was an excellent way to end the book, an excellent section. It, it's funny just how, how much it spells it out to you so that you, yeah, you kind of I, I I remember the first time I, I uh, listened to this, I remember I forgot about the It's Better Than Life game. So I was kind of like, this is so bizarre. Why is all this stuff happening? And then, um, you know, you kind of, when the, when it's, pe- uh, he gets the marks on his arm and then you're like, oh yeah, that's, that's right. And then you kind of slowly come to the realization then. I thought it was so funny seeing Rimmer's uh, fragile ego yeah. being displayed and, and his vision like the fact that his wife is like you know she's uh not even faithful to him on his wildest <laughs> fantasy yeah <laughs> and uh he i think who doesn't he he's like beating these best generals of all time that like these strategic games and then i think one of them doesn't know gazpacho soup is served cold and then rimmer like Thanks, reassures yeah. them <laughs> and he's like obviously that's what he wanted that all that long ago when he made that mistake i was not like prince charge or something like that it didn't do the gazpacho or something yeah yeah that's that was it yeah i I thought that was so funny and i thought the ending again the ending was again another pretty dark part of the book you know being trapped in this uh forever 
it was probably but abrupt is the only thing I would say about it and that seems to be because if you look at the title of the book that follows yes. this this was very much a setup to, is, to yeah. that book so that's that's why it feels yeah, a bit I've, re- I've read probably. the second book and it, it's a direct tie in it, it goes from where this book leaves off yeah so I, I thought it was still a pretty it was still a really good ending so it was but yeah it, it just felt a bit abrupt at that but Okay, and what did you think about the cat's, like, Valkyrie castle? Yeah, Has, has was just, <laughs> yeah, Has was just completely over the top ridiculous. I still, I, I still am struggling this entire review to believe that the cat is just actually a man, because I had this, like, feral, feral like, hairy cat creature on my head the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's just, he's just a guy with fangs. That's about that it. Works, <laughs> yeah. Like, that's about it. He's always wearing a suit. <laughs> yeah, that's about it. Right, uh, okay. Jason, anything you want to bring? Uh, yeah, I thought this was a strong final chapter. I would agree that the ending did just feel very abrupt. Like, there wasn't really much closure, maybe necessarily, with the ending. Yeah. I've never actually seen A Wonderful Life, so I never actually picked up that that's the street they was living on. I knew they had mentioned that street beforehand, so I knew there was, like, relevance to it, but I didn't sort of put two and two together that that was why it was Christmas Eve every night. So I've only just realised that now that you, Michael, mentioned it. But I did find it very touching that, you know, Lister's fantasy was just to have, like, a wife and kids that I loved. And just, like, a normal yeah. life. I th- I thought that was really nice. And that really spoke a lot to his character and made him very likeable. You know, maybe actually, if anything, maybe cured his assholeness. <laughs> the jury's still out on Rimmer. He's still an arsehole. No, that was a good, good, good end. I really liked it. Strong ending. Good stuff. Cool. And Johnny, finish us out there. Yeah, I liked again. Yeah, how Lister uh, he was the kind of character you know, just liked the simple things. And yeah, I thought it was very, very nice and satisfying that I just you know wanted all I wanted was this they settle down with this wee family with the, the girl next door kind of character and. Yeah, I liked, I thought Lister's whole thing was quite interesting. Yeah, it's funny, like, he made himself in this fantasy. He's, like, this big successful. But, yeah, I think Michael mentioned, like, his hot Brazilian uh, wife of his, like, you know, wasn't even faithful to him. And he's also made himself the only the third richest, why not the first? So I know, yeah. <laughs> these, like, insecurities still exist within his mad fantasy. He's still, even though this is, he can dream up whatever he wants here, he's, like, still been you know not exactly full on yeah i thought that's just quite interesting point of his character and yeah again the cat just absolutely madness his fantasy like um as you'd expect i i do agree that the ending was abrupt but i guess yeah if that's just it's it's more or less like the first book is actually just like you know the first two books is one book just part one and two essentially um yeah. so it's more just they split it on the size of it as opposed to you know um, that it's a complete story by itself. Um, it's very much, you know, kind of, you would need to go on to the second one now to continue on, um, which I definitely plan to do in the future. Yeah, I think I think they might have wrote this as like, you know, one big, like you said, one big book. And then I'm kind of thinking now, where else would you split it up? You know, I yeah. can't really think anywhere else from, from what I remember of the second book where you would cut it there. I think this is like, it kind of does make sense to do it there because it's like, they were heading back to Earth, and you think they are back on Earth now. Like, I like the twist that they weren't, they were on the game. I think you quickly kind of realise that they're on, that Sohan's not right here, because, like, of the ridiculousness of, like, Rimmer's success. But to be fair, I thought I was a bit caught by the, the twist uh, initially. And I think, yeah, it was good, because, like, you think that this is the climax of the book, is that they are, like, go back on Earth now, this is, the, this is them finished, uh, they've made it home. Only for that they'd be pulled out from under you. Um, so I actually think that, yeah, it was quite a clever ending. Yeah. You break it down, look. Nice. Well, I guess we'll move on to Star Rate now. So I suppose I'll go first. As I said, I love the book. I can't really fault it, but I don't think I'll give it a five. I think it would be four and a half, maybe. You know, it's, it's definitely a book that I would listen to again. Narration was, it was amazing. Chris Barry, fantastic job. Uh, I think four and a half. I like that it's still faithful to the show, but it also introduces a lot of new stuff. Do you know? Uh, Michael, what about you? Yeah, Stephen, I was just thinking if I could copy and paste what you said, uh, I probably would do that. Amazing narration, 
had so much fun with the story. This is the second time I listened to it, so I have listened to it again, and it was it was a pleasure to listen to it again. Uh, I would not give it the five either. I, I just think I give the five to uh, Hitchhikers, and I think just listening to that, it was just constant joy and fun. And Aye. this was this was almost there. It was the next best thing I would say, and and I know it's a it's probably an, a cliche to compare these two books at the same time, but it was always going to happen, you know, with us coming yeah, hot checkers first. Yeah, so it's just it's just not there at completely top marks for me, but it is it is very close. So I would also give it a four four point five as well. Cool, Johnny. Uh, overall, I thought this book was really good. The uh, narration as we've touched a wee bit on um was brilliant you know his, his range of voices even though i hated the cat and the sky <laughs> accent at the start got me a little bit um i just thought his range was brilliant and the, all the accents were so distinct and just brilliant the story uh just kind of it yeah like i've been saying it's just it just got better chapter on chapter like it's it just built the whole way out for me a lot of interesting wacky concepts sometimes it was i felt the only gripe i would have is like the wackiness, especially surrounding like the cat, was a bit, but over the top. But too um, much, that might, yeah. yeah, it might not always be a bad thing for most people, but just some of the times I just thought, like, just, what the hell is going on here? Like, <laughs> one of my last <laughs> Sunday. But yeah, overall, I really enjoyed it. So I am going to give it a four. Cool. And um, save the best for last. Big finish, Jason. <laughs> Big finish. That's what they call me. <laughs> 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 yeah, I tried. Like, I, I think what Michael said. It's hard not to compare this book against uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I, I really tried to not sit and compare it the entire time. I hope I haven't done that during its review because I know it's I don't think you it's have quite, quite right. cliche of me to just fucking riff on Hitchhiker's at this stage. <laughs> but I, I think this succeeded where Hitchhiker's failed. I think you know, the humour was there. It's funny. I think the actual tension and, like, the dramatic elements were much better. Uh, I still think it had its faults. You know, I, I, I by no means a perfect book, but uh, if we were to compare it to Hitchhikers for me personally, I think this is so much better. And, and again, I echo Johnny. Like, it's... I think each chapter it sort of got better, and I do think the final two chapters are probably my favorite parts of the book. Nice, except for Future Echoes. Future Echoes was not good. Well, I think that was the third, <laughs> the third last chapter, wasn't it? Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, it doesn't get better every time. No, well, true, you true. Know. You're right. Future Echoes is probably my least favorite chapter, if not maybe just the initial first chapter. But no, it's it, good. I would like to give this book a. 3.5 out of 5. There we go. So that's average at 4, four stars. There you go. Didn't think you'd get that, Stephen, did you? Nice. <laughs> Didn't think I would get that, no. I thought it was going to be me and Michael high and he's too low, but there, there we go. That was a good time. Uh, cool. All right. Uh, so I suppose we'll move on now to comparisons. I have a few, but I suppose, do you, do you just want to? I would like to compare it to Hitchhiker's. Yeah, saw that coming. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever hear of this uh, book called Hitchhikers, by any chance? No, tell uh, me about it. That, hey. That's quite good, huh? I think, um, I think this book, as a, I've, I've referenced this show many times on this podcast, weirdly, a weirdly lot of times for, for it to have nothing to do with audiobooks, but I felt so much Futurama in this story. Uh, I think there's massive, yeah, yeah there's massive uh, influence on Futurama from this. Well, obviously, the big one is the the stasis or you know cryo the freezing, <laughs> freezing yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I never yeah. even crossed my mind, Michael, but you're absolutely spot on. Yeah, like it is just yeah. British Futurama, <laughs> <laughs> which is a it's just a show I absolutely love. Like, so that's probably why it resonates with me so much. Yeah, yeah. same here. Uh, I could watch that fucking show for days. Uh, personally, I think Futurama is far superior to. This, but I mean, I've not watched the Red Drawer. You haven't watched the I show. Haven't, but I know. Well, I suppose that's the other thing. I don't actually have any intention of watching the show after reading the book. That's fair enough. I've said that the well, I've said that sort of opposite regarding Slow Horses. I've no intention of reading the books, but enjoy the show. <laughs> uh, that's fair enough. Like as long as you got some enjoyment out of it, I'm happy. Yeah. 
Well, the show is on BBC A Player, and it's only like, you know, we 20 minute episodes, six episodes a season, so it is handy to watch. Oh, that makes me more likely to watch it <laughs> if it's a short. Yeah. I mean, for me, the the big comparison is um, The Odd Couple, first of all, but then the show itself, <laughs> obviously. I mean, yeah. I mean, for for other media, that's the the main one. So, I sort of touched on it a few times, but the sh- obviously the the plot points are all lifted from the show, but there's a lot of stuff in the book that doesn't happen. For example, all the stuff on Minus at the start that doesn't happen. You kind of you kind of come in and Lester's already on board the ship, and you don't know why he's there, or you know that he, there's there's uh, you know he's trying to get back to Earth or anything. That's never alluded to. Uh, and then s- some stuff happens differently, like um, the whole Nova 5 thing about it crashing, that's never talked about, but then, uh, sorry, s- stuff that happens differently, so like Rimmer's double appears, but it's kind of, you know, they don't fix up the Nova 5 or anything like that, they just sort of love together, and they drive each other mad, and then like smuggling the cat is different as well, because he, he doesn't do it because he wants to go back to Earth, he just does it because he's lonely and stuff, so... There's a lot of differences, which which I, I think kept it like uh, kept the book interesting for me the first time around. Um, but it also kind of builds on the world, so that, uh, yeah, that's one reason why I really liked it. Uh, trivia, I've got a few bits of trivia if you want to hear it. Like, go for it. Yeah, go for it. Steve. The, the first one, Chris Barry, the narrator. I think we talked about it before, but he is one of the characters on the show. He plays Rimmer, but he's also like a comedian. And I think in the 90s, 80s and 90s, he would do, like, impressionist stuff in his stand-up show. And that's why I think his performances are so good. Because, you know, he he's obviously worked with the cast for so long. So he's able to... And he's an impressionist. So he's able to, like, copy their... You know, the way they talk. And perform their, you know, their lines and stuff. But I think he's just spot on. Particularly Lester and Crichton. I think he's got them, like, to a T. Mm. And then also, there's so there's three... This is the kind of bigger, interesting one for me. So there's three sequel books to this. There's Better Than Life, which we sort of talked about already. It's a direct sequel. Uh, but after that one, something strange happens. So the two creators of the show, Rob Grant and Doug Naylor, they, like, in the mid-90s, they decided to sort of go their own way. So one of them stayed right in the show, and the other one went off to do his own thing. But they'd already been contracted for two books. So they decided that each of them would write a different book, like their own story. And the same, like a, as its own sequel. So there's there's two sequels to Better Than Life. Which is kind of weird. So, you know, right. it's almost like parallel yeah. universe type thing. So it's quite interesting. That's probably interesting. I haven't read either of them. That's interesting. But I do intend to. I wonder if that's how they explain it. Like, do they be like, this is like a parallel story that like, I like an alternative you know, universe or something like, or why did they actually like? Spin Could up? be. I'm, I'm. I'm not sure, but I, I am interested to, to to listen to them or read them. I think it's more of the same though. They they sort of left more stuff from later seasons of the show, you know, and adapted a bit. But again, I haven't read them, so I don't know. I guess we can just move on to what else we're consuming. I mean, I I have plenty I could chat about since I missed out on this the last time. I don't even know if I've told you, I feel like it's been a while, but I, I did finish all three seasons of Slow Horses. If I had to rank them, I would probably say season two is my favourite. I don't know if you'd agree or not with me there. I think I would agree, yeah. you know. I'd, I think I would. I, I, yeah. I, think, I think I would say season three is probably my least favourite. I think I would agree as well, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> right, yeah well, there you go. But a really good show, definitely. Season two is very good, like definitely the highlight for me. I've just been battering through The Wire... I'm almost finished season four. Watched the new season of True Detective of Mary Kate. Would recommend that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> since since we sort of chose Red Dwarf, like I said, sort of blasted through that in like one weekend. I think I've managed to go th- complete two other audiobooks and start my third. If not, yeah, I think that was it. So I managed to listen to. Psychopath Test by John Ronson, uh, which is an interesting read. Surprisingly, like a lot of uh, non-fiction, actually. Another audiobook. If I read this Psychopath book, does it is there a test in it? Because I'd be scared no. in case I... No, well, it talks about the test, but I don't, I don't think the actual... T- 
test is like fully written out. That was nice. quite interesting. Actually, yeah, no, there's there's I finished three books because I, I recommended one to you, Stephen, and you didn't like it, and that was the This Is Gonna Hurt uh, by. Yeah, I might, I might give it another try. The, I can't remember what his name is now, but that NHS doctor, a former NHS doctor, Adam. Sutton. Adam. Yeah, can't remember what his name is now actually. But like best selling book. Also listened to Jeanette McCurdy's book. Nice. Back when I was about in Derry for a few days. There's definitely another one or two actually. I've absolutely blessed through the books recently. Oh yeah, and then I moved on to <laughs> uh, an actual author from Derry, uh Seamus O'Reilly. He has a, a oh, very nice. short book out called Did You Hear Mommy Died? It's only about four and a half hours long. That's quite quite funny, just about his experiences as a child of, you know, a, from a family of, you know, two parents and eleven children, all from the border, essentially. But the mum dies quite young. Uh, that was quite interesting, especially from him being from Derry and like sort of naming streets of Derry and everything like that. And uh, I've now finally moved on to uh, No Country for Old Men, so just sort of back on that Cormac McCarthy. Grind that I stopped after Blood and Rain for a while, um, but I I'm only about two three chapters in, but I do feel like it's a lot easier to follow along compared to Blood and Rain. I just don't know what it is about Blood and Rain compared to other Cormac McCarthy books, but it's all the death between the road and between <laughs> the no country for the relentless men, sadness. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I I could follow along with these two. So much easier than I could with Blood Meridian. I don't know what it is. I just don't think Blood Meridian lends itself to audiobook form that well. But we discussed that in length before. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that's, that's. I mean, uh, yeah, I was saying you guys have booked my honeymoon. Nice. Off to, off to Mexico. That's that's me. All caught up. Very nice. So, Michael or Johnny, do you want to go next? I've been back playing Assassin's Creed. I'm on the Revelations now, and I've also almost finished it and got Assassin's Creed 3 downloaded. Um, I really liked Assassin's Creed 3, so I'm looking forward to playing it for the first time in 10 years. I've been reading another audiobook I've been doing, The Republic by Plato. I um, don't know if any of you have ever heard of Plato. Pretty smart guy, like. But yeah, it's it's about, I think it's 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 basically about like government and stuff, and like what's the per- the, the perfect kind of like government, like the real um, over a city and stuff. I'm obviously written back in you know the BC times, so it's a pretty old book. Basically, a lot of, of like two chapters on that, but like it's basically it starts with like Socrates like talking with people, and he's like more or less trying to get somebody to contradict themselves. He's like, "Do you believe that uh, you know a good person is just?" And okay, if a good person is just, then is this kind of person just? And then you know he goes in this big loop they just end up getting around to make the person contradict themselves. I was like, geez, he was a bit of a decade. <laughs> Making people, like, uh, roast themselves, basically. Uh, but that was quite interesting. Yeah, apart from that, it's uh, getting into the, the summer, some more closer to the summer months now, so I've been doing a bit of pre-gardening, you know, so I'll have to update about whatever's been grown this year. I've got a lot of stuff on the, on the go with the man. It's been too much to go through, but I'm sure I'll go back and do whatever's whatever's actually coming free then whenever we start getting fruits but um also i think i mentioned this last time i've been doing like reading a physical book so for february i was reading the chinese myths book i actually haven't finished it yet um a little bit behind but i'm almost have only got like 20 pages left um so basically get finished tonight or tomorrow but yeah quite an interesting book about the chinese mythology it's I think the the thing with I remember I read the book The Art of War is also like a like a Chinese book so like you get a lot of like names I think are quite hard to like remember and stuff so it's quite hard to like follow all the names like you know if I were reading a Greek book I could hear like the name Zeus and like that's I remember that but the Chinese ones are obviously Chinese names they're more of the Chinese style so I just find them quite hard to remember but in terms of the actual like their stories and stuff you can see like a lot of similarities between a lot of Western uh, muffs and stuff but then there's also some like mad stuff as well that happens so yeah it's co- quite quite an interesting mythology and um, my next book that i'll be picking up for march is going to be the atomic habits book which is i think it's james clear is it care bought me it for my birthday so i think that's quite a popular one at the minute um i think it's mm-hmm. some guy you know kind of like a self-help kind of book you know going through different habits that people are of like bad habits that people have and how they 
fix them and stuff. So that'll be an interesting one. Um, so that'll be the the book I'll be starting hopefully in the next few days. So yeah, that's that's pretty much pretty much me. Uh, Michael, what you got? Yeah, haven't consumed as much stuff as I normally would like to because um I applied for a few jobs and have been like prepper uh preparing for them like a couple of are like internal into the current workplace that I'm on and then another was like a media job so I got to like as I said to you guys on our chat I got to drop the podcast in there as like a selling point which was funny I haven't heard anything anything back yet for my interviews I've attended a couple now it's uh it's been a stressful week I do not like interviews but I don't think anybody really does I I finished uh Succession with Greta that fourth season ending was spectacular it was so good i miss the show so much uh, it's already we haven't we haven't picked anything up again yet even though we said that we would jump right into another show we've just kind of let the week stretch out and like morning of not being able to watch the show anymore <laughs> i listened to a few audiobooks as well i listened to uh columbus day by craig allenson which is like a uh it's kind of a military sci-fi book it's a, it's a really fun book, so it is, and the narration in that book is fantastic. I think it would be an interesting book for us to cover in the show one day. I'm not sure how everybody would feel about it, but I really like the book, so I, I might pick it one day. I finished a book called The Painted Man by uh, Peter V. Brett. It's like a epic fantasy one. It wasn't my favourite book, but yeah, I still, still enjoyed it okay. And I listened to Billy Summers by Stephen King. Uh, which is I never listened to that before. As far as like and the King rankings, I'd probably put it somewhere near the bottom middle. It wasn't a classic or it wasn't classic King or anything, but it was it was pretty solid kind of crime. One of his crime books more. But other than that, I've been you know writing away as well. I've been um working on the book still. Uh, it's gotten it's grown far beyond what it was when I talked about it a few months back. It's just kind of taking on a life of its own as pretentious as that sounds where like it feels like it's kind of right in itself and like that i'm slowly losing control and that that it's just it's its, its own entity it's probably the best thing that i've i've written but it's still i think it's still not really near ready it needs a few more it needs a lot of work still uh, but I'm, I'm i'm chipping away at it and i will be sending it out when it's when it's done but it's still there's still a lot of moving pieces to be put together in it and a lot of different things need worked out and a lot of sections need rewritten and a lot of characters need rejigged and a lot of things that weren't foreshadowed need foreshadowed and just a lot of shit but i'll get there in the end (laughs) but yeah that's it that's everything for me basically good man i suppose for me uh still watching like i said on the last episode watching a lot of naruto uh i watched a couple episodes tonight Doing a lot of Japanese as well uh, on Duolingo. Got in the Diamond League there. It was pretty good. People on that are nuts though. They are never off the thing. Wait until you get into the Diamond Tournament, lad. Even worse. Aye. Jeepers, there's people getting like 10,000 experience every day. Here, every day? Jesus. Aye. <laughs> they must never be off the thing. <laughs> I got in the Diamond League and, uh, you know, I was the first couple of days I was like, you know, putting in maybe a couple hundred a day or something, right? But then I, I really lost heart when the first place person had like 20,000 points in three days or something. And I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> I give up. <laughs> Fuck that. Nice. Uh, but yeah, it's just cracking on with that. It's quite, it's quite enjoyable. I'm listening to Ready Player One again at the minute. Um, I just wanted something light. After, I just wanted something after that Doctor book that was a bit more light. And, you know, I can just put it on and not really pay attention. The Doctor book, I think I'll give it another... The, what was it called? This Is Gonna Hurt, the one you recommended me just now. Yeah. I, I think I'm going to give it another go. I don't know what it was about it that I didn't like, as I said. I couldn't pinpoint it. TV-wise, I'm watching Spaced every so often. Another British TV show of Simon Pegg and Nick Frost and Bill Bailey's in it and stuff. Um, <clears throat> what else? I'm trying to think. I'm not playing any new games at the minute. I'm still playing World of Warcraft like a... The wee gremlin. <laughs> and yeah, that's about it. Actually, I wanted to ask something. So I was going to watch the the Dune film, the first one. Yeah. I've never watched it before. Don't don't slate me for that, Michael or Jason or Johnny. Uh, <laughs> but I was going. I was thinking about reading the book first 
And now, Michael, you're the type of guy who's dug both. So, which would you recommend doing first? Yeah. Um, I've done both as well. Have you? Yeah. I've, You've read June? I've oh, nice. read about half of it physically. I've listened to the full audiobook. And I've seen the film twice. The most recent film twice. Or, sorry, the... Right. Not the, not the news release, but, sorry, the June part one. Um... I don't know. Like, would it ruin it for me if I watched the film first? Well, the the book itself is the I two think... films together. Right. So June part one finishes only about halfway. I think you could do either, Stephen. I think um, there's no real way that would one would ruin the other. Like, I don't think it would not that would ruin happen. it, but but I think if you would were it looking... ru- lessen my enjoyment of the book, I suppose it would because I wouldn't know the plot and stuff. But I don't know. I think if you were looking for the optimum experience, I would say the book first. You know, I think it would yeah. it would deepen the movie yeah. more than the other way around. Of. But one thing I would I would warn you about the June book is it is quite dense and it's a lot. It's on a lot of people's did not finish uh, shelf. It's quite a it's quite a strangely it's kind of strange the way it plays. It's like treads this line between uh, fantasy and sci-fi and it can be a wee bit dense but once you kind of get into the flow of it there's just it's the way it seems to work with that book is it just clicks for people at some stage right and once if you do put up with it until it clicks it, it can be a real it's it's a great book then yeah. but um i would say try the book if you're not enjoying it just go watch the movie but if you uh, are enjoying it yeah i would say the book and then the movie's probably a good right, way to do cool. it you would probably enjoy yeah, I don't the know movie how I more must- for the book, I would say. Do you think? But yeah, yeah. Like if you if you listen to the book first, I think you'd appreciate the film more. But obviously, there's the gotcha. other way of looking at it that yeah. if you'd seen the film beforehand, you'll be able to put the characters to the to the names, and it will help your uh-huh. understanding, your sort of ability to follow the book. Because there's a lot of characters, and there's a lot happening. As Michael says, yeah. it's very dense and can be a bit difficult to keep up with the lore. Yeah. There's a lot of lore I uh, as well. It's kind of like you know, yeah, Lord of the like Rings books to movies. You know the, ah, the mo- it's, it's it's good. Yeah, good read, good listen. Yeah, I don't know how it slipped me by the film that is like I, I don't know what was going on at the time. When was that released? Two years ago or something? I was still living in Belfast, newborn, I think. So maybe. two three years ago, twenty twenty one maybe. I I had a newborn. That's what it was. Ah, that'd be why. Makes sense now. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so I think I think I'll read the book first. I know that uh, Pierce Brown, Red Rising author, he says it's one of his like inspirations. So and that's my favorite book series. So uh, big big hope for this one. Very different books. I I imagine they are, but hopefully Pierce has good taste. So uh, yeah, that's kind of everything for me. We'll move on to plugs then. Michael and Johnny used to always have plugs, so. Everyone wants to go first, on <laughs> I guess I'll go first. Yeah, just my the YouTube channel. I've released a few videos there in the last few weeks. Just again about um, the Q language, which I use in my day job. And I'm just kind of tutorial like short videos, um, just showing different aspects of the language. Yeah, so yeah, you can check that out for that. And like, I hope they grow it on the all their programming stuff in the future. But yeah, it's just fine time here these days. You know, there's many audiobooks to be read and. YouTube That's videos it. to be created and podcasts to be recorded. It's just just all happening. And I don't even have a child yet, so it's just, I don't know yeah. how you stay it. Is there plans there? Or? Uh, well, in the next 20, 30 years, okay. I'd say. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, just the usual stuff for me. Uh, check out The Dark Tales if you want some horror stories of varying lengths. Uh, I think the shortest story is about 10 minutes long, and then the biggest story, if you put them together, is... Actually, I don't know the length, but I know it's about 34,000 words. The White Winter ones came off, which is like just shy of a novella. Or if you want, if you prefer, I have a fantasy series as well. It's a fantasy book that I wrote like four years ago. Uh, Soul Bonder was the first book that I wrote to try and teach myself how to write. It's a very flawed work, but it's still work that I am proud of for, for completing and seeing it through. And I think they uh, are getting to, towards more the middle, well, still still the early part of the book that's read out so far but gradually clawing towards the middle and i do think the climax is very satisfying so uh just to just to build that up a bit but uh check those out and and the links below and jonathan and i do a movie podcast as well uh real report we 
recorded an episode there not long ago so i have to put that together along with this episode as well link will for that will be in the the show notes as well cool all right uh well that sort of concludes my part of this the episode so we'll move on to johnny for the next pick yeah so this this book is probably going to be one that i'd say very few people have ever heard of or read so i don't think i think he's can all probably have a guess so it's this little indie book called the hobbit written by J.R. Tolkien and read by Andy Serkis. Who wants to have a guess first at what this book's called? <laughs> yeah, so obviously, um, I think the only absolute, you know, giant series, I know we've done a couple of epic fantasies, but absolute, like, I mean, appeals to everyone, not just the nerdy people, I'm pretty sure. This, along with Harry Potter, you know, this is probably our second absolute humongous series um, that we're getting into here so i'll obviously hope they cover the other lord of the rings books books in future episodes um but yeah i think starting off with the hobbit even though i know the hobbit was written first but in terms of the movies people will be more familiar probably with the lord of the rings but then maybe not because the hobbits movies are more recent as well so i guess maybe in a more recent generation they might have seen that um but i feel like the hobbit's uh a nice cozier book they read nice uh, light, a lighter book there's mm-hmm. definitely obviously dark parts on it and stuff um but yeah i just feel like it's a, definitely a good in terms of when you're going book wise it's definitely a good intro to the to the series have you read it before john i have listened to i do you know what i have the audiobook so i have the audiobook on audible but it's narrated by somebody else uh, and this is before andy circus did it so i have just it's also on spotify's thing included with a membership so that one is the andy circus one so it's the one i'm gonna that's nice so i've I've listened to the two towers with andy circus that was the first so i actually listened to the fellowship too was narrated by somebody else um so yeah i'm looking forward to hearing andy circus doing the the um narrating i can't wait to talk about tom bombadil but anyway maybe if this uh the next episode is an enjoyable one to record we could do what we've done with the harry potter series and like open this as a series where we do like one of them manually but it's up to you guys we could see how the episode goes anyway only, and see how it pans out only if we do the similar right next oh yes let's do that <laughs> jack will love that that's one of our requests if we're doing the similar and we're, we're we're doing that after we've done the the trilogy <laughs> it's the one one yeah. like not poetry? Right. <laughs> mm, i haven't actually done any of the have you like done the fall gondola and all those kind of ones no not actually no 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 i would like to do those as well eventually but yeah you say i've i've listened to the full trilogy from narrated by andy circus and uh, I, I i love the hobbit like i've actually physically read the hobbit twice i actually yeah. would say it's probably my favorite book if people have ever asked me i would always have said the hobbit is my favorite book but i've never listened to the audiobook so very excited to actually get round to it finally so nice very good i was gonna say jonathan i think jonathan's heaven has sneaky pick for like his crowd pleaser for uh oh, book of the year again right. michael He's trying to here title. this is this is just absolute freaking <laughs> you know calling people out for no reason uh, yeah <laughs> lies and deceit but yeah if you don't all rate it five stars i'll be furious i'm gonna pick my a little book you might have heard of called The Game of Thrones next. Clang a dang I know, that's Clash of Kings, isn't it? <laughs> as much as you love The Game of Thrones, can you ever give a book that's like freaking 100 million hours five stars? Like, Yes. Oh, I have give first, ga- first Game of Thrones <laughs> easy five stars. I don't know about the first one. Nine I don't stars. know about the first one. Oh, easy. Listen, we'll, we'll talk about the ratings for Game of Thrones when we get there. For right now, we're doing The Hobbit and sure, <laughs> we'll see. It's definitely going to be dragged down. The score is going to go down for from for Tom Bombadil's chapters. It's going to. I'm going to pull it down for that. He's not on the Hobbit, but isn't he? No, uh, I don't think he's, he's on. The Hobbit. Oh, he's in the fellowship. fellowship. He's in the fellowship. Oh, never mind then. Never mind then. Nah. Uh, Ignore all that. <laughs> You're back. We're all good. <laughs> That's a five. Five there, Johnny. Come on. Happy days. <laughs> no, whoever picks the fellowship. Thank God, actually, because fucking No baller than just a reiterate that again that is The Hobbit by J.R. Token and that is narrated by Andy Serkis well Lewis thanks for listening and I'll see you next time Later. catch you on the season we're all thinking it we're all thinking it <laughs> <laughs>